what we're doing for today, um, essentially because we have so much time left. Um, so what we've been studying is essentially constructing and testing hypotheses about, or hypotheses about uh, population parameters of uh, statistical models. So the idea is you have a, a population with a sampling distribution, P of X, which depends upon some finite dimensional parameters, theta. In our case, typically mu or sigma squared, the mean and variance, respectively, of this PDF. Uh, we obtain a random sample associated to the underlying dynamics of the uh, population, typically IID uh, following the underlying PDF. And then what we do is we hypothesize a particular thing that we want to reject, for example, the null hypothesis that an underlying mean or variance has some pre-specified value uh, against an alternative which is th th this is not holding or that you have some one or two-sided alternative. And then we construct a statistic which is a function of the random sample and the parameter of interest such that we know the distribution of the test statistic and uh, we construct a region for which the chance of making a type 1 error uh, is exactly alpha. And on the basis of the realized value of the statistic, we accept or reject the null hypothesis. So if you remember what we were looking at yesterday, okay, this is the particular procedure. So this case was the, the idea that you wanted to look at the case where you had a pair of random samples where you don't know the variances, but the number of samples in these pairs of independent samples are relatively large. And the basic procedure was uh, that here in this case where we wanted to test the null hypothesis that the difference in the means was zero versus the case that they were bigger than zero, the uh, procedure was that you set the level of significance, i.e. the probability of a type 1 error, and then the statistic in this case, which was the last thing we looked at, was of this form, and that was approximately Gaussian distributed. We'd seen that uh, yesterday. Then what we did is we, in this case, it's a one-sided test, so the critical region is just going to be the value of Z alpha, the quantile of uh, a Gaussian distribution, so that's 2.3263. We evaluated the test statistic uh, under the realized data. Okay, and in this case, basically, that was 3.3355. And in, in our scenario, that's bigger than the critical value, so we reject the null hypothesis. The alternative re re procedure was to compute the p-value, which is the probability that the test statistic, would, viewed as a random function of the data, exceeds precisely the realized value of the statistic. That's the p-value here. And if that's less than the level of significance, we also reject the null hypothesis, which is exactly what we did here. So that's where we left off. Oh, page 72. Sorry. Sorry. I'm talking about. Sorry, that was not where we left off. That was, uh, that's what we're about to do. Sorry about that. But uh, we had done something similar yesterday. OK, that's the procedure. So this situation is you have a pair of samples, a pair of random samples of different sizes, where those sample sizes are very large. And we don't know the pairs of variances sigma square 1, sigma square 2. So we refer to section 6.4.2. So just to understand what it is we're talking about, let me just open these lecture notes. Chapter 6. So section 6.4. Let's go to page 75. So section 6.4. Yes. Okay, so this was this notion here that this statistic, basically the, the statistic where you take the difference of the means, uh, sample means, difference with the difference of the absolute means divided by this thing is Gauss, exactly Gaussian. That was the thing that we studied back there. Okay, so this scenario, this is what we're looking at. So let's have a look at an example of, of the particular test statistic that one can drive based upon the particular scenario we're studying and the associated distribution of the test statistic that we have just investigated. So the idea here is you're looking at this particular example, so you want to select 
Uh, sulfur concrete for roadway construction in regions that experience heavy frost. Okay, so it's not particularly relevant for Singapore, but anyway. And basically it's important that uh, the chosen concrete has a low value of thermal conductivity in order to minimize subsequent damage due to changing temperatures. Okay, so basically you have two types of concrete. Uh, this is type one, this is type two, if you like. Okay, and you have this data, which are basically the two types, graded, no fines, the sample sizes, which are equal, and you basically have two uh, collection, which is the means and averages of the associated, sorry, the means and the variances associated, or standard deviations, of this uh, conductivity. And the question we want to ask in this particular study is, does this information suggest that the true conductivity for the graded concrete exceed that for the no fines concrete? Con concrete, uh, sorry, and alpha is equal to 0 0.01, okay? So again, basically the idea is that what we're going to do is we're going to test a, a hypothesis about the difference in the mean parameters of these sampling distributions, which again, as we say, they're approximately normal, or like N1 or N2 are large enough, but their variances are different and unknown, okay? So this one is the, the test at zero, so we really want to reject this one, and this is the case where basically this type is better than this type on average. Okay, and again, we know the step size is 0 0.0, uh, the uh, size of the test is 0 0.01. So we know, just as on the basis of the conversation of the start of this lecture, that this particular statistic is for N1 and N2 large enough or exact Gaussian sampling distributions of the associated random variables that this is normal 0 0.01. Okay, so this is our statistic. We know the distribution of it. We now know that if we set alpha to be 0.01, then our rejection region is defined by the upper quantile Z 0.01. It's a one-sided test, remember. And so this one value from tables is 2.33 approximately. Okay, so now we're in a good position because basically all we have to do is to compute the realized value of the associated test statistic and we know that the critical region, i.e. the region for which we will reject the null hypothesis, is if essentially these uh, realized value of the statistic ex exactly exceeds the value 2.33. Okay, now we can compute this under the null hypothesis. So under the null hypothesis, obviously this is zero. Okay, and the difference of the means, well, we can get that from this table, right? We have these two means here. And then we need to have the sample standard deviations as well. Okay, so we just now substitute into this formula. So N1, N2 are the same 35. The two sample standard deviations squared are 0.187 squared, 0.158 squared. That comes precisely from our table. And we just substitute these numbers into our formula to obtain uh, the statistic, which is 3.335, okay? So that's the value of the statistic, okay? And in this case, we can also compute the p-value. So as I said, and mistakenly thought that we'd done that yesterday, we didn't. But basically, the probability that the statistic as a function of the data which is random exceeding the realized value of the statistic is, this, is by definition the p-value and this one can be obtained by inverting Gaussian tables. So it's very small apparently. Okay, so what's the conclusion of this particular study? So if you take the cr critical region, basically the point is that we exceed the critical value little z, so therefore uh, we reject the null hypothesis and similarly this p-value is exceedingly small, smaller than the level of the significance or size of our test, therefore we also reject on the basis of the p-value. Okay, so it's, it's a fairly simple mechanism that we're performing. Okay, so the next scenario, so we, you know, we're cycling through all our confidence intervals and this is the next one. Um, here we have a pair of random samples, independent identically distributed samples. We don't know the variances, but we're assuming that they're equal. And uh, basically the sample sizes are relatively small. And we refer basically to section 6.4.3, which is what? Well, basically, if we can find it, this is this one, right? So basically, this is the same setup. Sigma 1 square, sigma 2 square are equal. Two populations are normal, but the sample sizes are small, okay? So in this scenario, the difference of the means, we can, we can easily, so remember these random variables which form this and this are mutually independent. So basically one can easily derive that this thing is Gaussian distributed with the, with the variances. I think we derived this, but it's very simple. I'm happy to do it for you if you want. 
Okay, so that's what we have. That's our setup. So the key, the key thing is then basically ba on the basis of this statistic, of course, now we center by the difference in the population means and divide through by this um, the square root of this uh, quantity, we'll get a Gaussian normal 0 one. That's going to give us our test statistic, which is enabling us to test hypotheses about the difference in the means. Okay, so let's have a look. Okay, so we can basically, because we know the test statistic I've just told you, we can go straight into this uh, example, uh, which feels like we've done it before, but um, and we have in fact. So you have a course in math, it's uh, taught to 12 students by a conventional classroom, and the other second group is, uh, let's say, using some of these flipped classrooms uh, program materials, apparently. So, at the end of the semester, they basically take the same exam. The 12 students in the classroom got an average grade of 85, standard deviation 4. And uh, the 10 students using these uh, programmed flipped classrooms. So, sorry, do you mind? There's, uh, there's like 10 of us here, so can you please keep time? Thanks. Sorry, I don't mean to embarrass you. Um, so then the 10 students using program materials made uh, an average of 81, standard deviation of 5. So now what we're going to do is to test the hypotheses that they basically these means are equal and where we're using a size of the test is 0.1. And we assume the populations to be approximately normal and equal variances. So we're basically in the setup that we specified at the beginning. Okay, so now what we're going to do, so we want them to be different, right? So then we're going to test the hypothesis. So mu1, mu2 is the average grade. We want to test basically whether they're essentially different. That's the whole idea here. So basically, this is our null hypothesis, which we would like to reject, and that they're not equal, which we really want to accept. Okay, we know our level of significance. It's 10%. We've been told that. 1.1, probably see our type 1 error. And so now we basically use the statistic, right? So this is the statistic that we were talking about here. Um, here that this thing, sigma squared, okay, if you, if, if you don't know this, remember that we had done that last week where we estimated the variance by the pooled sample variance. Okay, so that's what we did last week. And we're using that estimate inside here. So this thing, remember, when you substitute in, so we had said then basically, when it's not known, you, you have that this thing is t on n minus 1. That's the, that's the result we're using. Sorry, I hadn't forgot or neglected to mention that when you don't know the variance, this is the thing that you do. But you're assuming they're equal. Okay, so this is the statistic we're using. Okay, we know that this is t distributed on n1 plus n2 minus 2 degrees of freedom. Okay, so basically now it's a two-sided test. So what we have to do in order to compute the rejection region, we need to find the values of this thing. This is not correct, by the way. This is an alpha over two, not an alpha. Okay, so just mention if you if you if you're interested, you know, you have a typo in the notes. Oh, it's not my notes. So you could have a look. So the n1 and n2. So that's 12 plus uh, 20. So 22 minus 2 is 20. So we want t on 20, 0 0.05. Okay, not 0. Point, this would be 0 0.1. Okay, so that's 1.725, and remember that the t distribution is symmetric. Uh, the center is a center of t distribution, so symmetric around zero. So t, 1.725, that's a critical region if you exceed or if you're below the, the negative value. Okay, and this is our test statistic, and we know how to compute the pooled example sample variance. Okay, this is the thing that we were just mentioning a moment ago. So we're now very far advanced into our procedure. All we have to do is to now calculate the associated value of the statistics. So if you cast your mind back just two minutes ago, the sample mean for this uh, students who were in the classroom was 85, and its associated variance was apparently 16, and the mean for the other group with the flipped classroom was 81, and uh, the standard deviation was 5. N1 and N2, 10 and 12 respectively, to, uh, 12 and 10 respectively. So you can easily compute the, uh, the pooled sample variance. Okay, so it has this formula here, this is 1 over 20, this is uh, what, ele uh, 11, this one is uh, uh, 16, and this one is uh, 9, and this one is uh, whatever it was, it's uh, 25. Okay, so that's the, no that's the value of the sample pooled variance. So now we've got the pooled variance, okay, or the square root of it, that we can compute our statistic, 
And our statistic, we're just computing, this one was 85, the real realized value, this was 81. We're testing that these things are equal, so under the null, this is equal to zero. And then we've just computed this one, and this is one over 12 plus one over 10. Okay, so if you do substitute those numbers into this formula, it's fairly straightforward, you will get a realized value of the T statistic, which is precisely 2.086. Now what we need to do, well we don't have to, but if you want to use the p-value system, so remember that the p-value system in this case, when you have a two-sided alternative, is two times the minimum of the probability that the test statistic, assuming the data is random, exceeds the value or is less than this value. Okay, so obviously in these two, if these two extremes, the minimum of these two is obviously this one because this is an extreme value. And this value apparently is 0.025. So the p-value is 2 times 0 0.025. So the p-value is 0 0.05. Okay. Well, we already know the results of this particular test, right? If we use our p-values, uh, this critical region we reject, and if we use our p-values, we reject. Okay, that's, that's exactly what this slide says. The observed value t.086 falls inside the critical region, so we reject the null hypothesis. So basically, there is a difference between these two methods, on average, if we believe this test. And since the p-value is 0 .005, point, sorry, 0 0.05, that's less than 0 0.1, we all know that. And so at this 10% level, 10 level of significance, we would uh, also reject the null hypothesis. And so note, of course, that if you change the, null hy the uh, v level of significance, you're going to change this as well. But you're also going to change, uh, you're also going to change this t-value, right? Obviously with the, out with the correct value of over 2. Okay, and again, another typo, just in case you get confused as I did, this is a really example three. Okay, very good. So we've cycled through a lot of our uh, confidence intervals, and there's only three confidence intervals left. So remember the technique again, you, you, you have a confidence interval, which gives you a pivot, you invert the pivot, there's a probability statement about the, the parameter, which gives you the chance that the parameter lies in a confidence interval is exactly one minus alpha, and basically you invert that back as a function of, of uh, a statistic to get your t-statistic, and so basically we have at our disposal the three remaining confidence intervals to construct hypothesis tests. And our next one is the paired data. So the paired data, so 6.4.4, so again it's relevant for us to check what that was all about. And uh, we're gonna find it in a moment. Okay, so in this case, remember the situation is this. We have, basically, this was about diets. If you remember, basically, this time last week, we started talking about these diets. The idea is you basically have paired data. So you have a collection of random variables, for example, before a diet, and a collection of random variables after a diet, so the weight of an individual. Obviously, there's a correlation between uh, the individuals before and after that diet, so therefore, uh, there's some dependence between the samples. So remember, in the two tests that we've talked about, uh, the one test, we've talked two tests we talked about before, the, the, there is an independence between those two random samples, whereas that is not the case in this scenario. Now, what we wanted to do in this particular uh, confidence interval was to construct confidence intervals associated to essentially the difference in the uh, means of the samples, okay? And uh, so to cut a long story short, if we define d bar to be the average of those differences and s d squared to be the variance of these differences, okay, then basically we're able to derive a test statistic. So you can look back in this notes, so you remember that t d bar minus mu d over s d over root n is approximately t on n minus one, where we're assuming that basically these xi's, I guess, are uh, may not X and I's and Y's are on the same individual, but basically they have some probabilistic relationship, which they are values from a population which is Gaussian with mean mu d and variance sigma squared d. So this is our setup. We have individuals, paired data, we've computed the differences, but we're assuming that the differences are IID. They're IID with normal mean mu d and, and variance sigma squared d. And what we want, what we want to do is on the basis of this statistic, capital T, to construct hypothesis tests precisely about the mean of the difference of these two um, variables. Okay, so that's why I'm referring back to that. So let's so now we know what is the hypothesis test and the scenario. We can go straight into an example. So what we want to do, we want to compare 
two methods for determining the percentage of iron ore and ore samples, okay? So you have 12 ore samples split into two. One is randomly selected and subjected to method one, and the other half is method two, okay? And you get some results, which is here. Okay, so this is presum presumably the, the percentage of iron ore in sample one and sample, in, in sample one up to 12 uh, using method one and method two. I mean, basically the point is that these give us our differences, which we're interested in. So the idea is that we're interested in working out whether there's a significant difference between my method one and method two. I'm not sure what do they do. It doesn't, really tell you, it doesn't really tell you what method what they do. They basically are two different methods for determining the percentage of iron ore in, in an ore sample. Okay, very exciting. So basically the question we're asking ourselves is do the data provide sufficient evidence that method two is better on average than method one? And we, of course we're just in this scenario, as we said, where the, basically the differences are, are IID Gaussians. And we're using a significance level, we're asked, of a 0.05. Okay, so what is our hypothesis test? So mu d, remember that's the mean of these differences. Um, that's basically, um, so that's the mean of the differences, and we want to test the hypothesis. First of all, we want to reject the case that they're essentially equal, mu d is equal to zero, and the alternative is that mu t is less than zero. And why is that? Well, because basically these differences the difference between method one and method two. And I want to work out if method two, on average, is better than method one. So that is the, whether mu d is less than zero. And that's really what I'm interested in. So that's why, so the answer to the question why this is the alternative. Okay. So now we have that. We're ready, really ready to go now. We know the level of significance. We've been told is 0 0.05. So now the number of samples was 12, and we know, no, it doesn't imply, but we know that basically our test statistic T is a T distribution on N minus one degrees of freedom. It's one-sided, so basically now we just have 0 0.05 here, because that's our chosen value of alpha. So T11 0 0.05 is apparently 1.796. So now what we're going to do is we're going to reject all values of the test statistic, capital T, um, which was this thing, if it's less than minus 1.796. So remember that we're doing the test. This is the hypothesis, okay? So basically, now what we're doing is we're looking at the left tail uh, of the T distribution. So it's minus 1.796. Maybe be careful about that. Okay, so now what we're doing is basically we're going to compute this statistic under the null hypothesis that mu d is equal zero. So that's pretty straightforward. So, I mean, this is now just a s simple arithmetic, essentially. You want to compute, basically, the uh, mean of the differences, and the mean of the difference is just the sum of the means, sum of the differences divided by 12, because there are 12 data points. Okay, the sum of the squares will allow you to get the standard deviation. If you do that, I don't think I need to teach you how to do that. That's 0 0.00072. Okay. So now, the test statistic under the null hypothesis, so this is the mean, minus 0 0.1, 0 0.167, divided by, and the statistic, remember if you're worried, is SD over square root of N. So this is SD over square root of N, and that's apparently minus 2.156. So we know at this point of time, immediately if we're using the rejection region, uh, or critical region procedure, that we're going to reject because this is more extreme than our, uh, uh, this lies in your side, our critical region. The T value, so the T value is the probability that the T, that this test statistic when treating the data as random exceeds the realized value of your statistic. So that's basically, uh, sorry, is, is more extreme. So in this case, being less than minus 2.156. So you can basically find that, I hope, from tables. So it's 0.027. So again, using the p-value, you're going to reject. So this conclusion of this particular procedure for this example, so the observed value minus 2.156, it lies in the critical region, so you reject the null and you like the fact that method two seems to be better than method one on average, or alternatively, if you use the p-value, again, that's less than or equal to uh, 0.05, or certainly less than, so we basically, again, make the same conclusion that method two seems to be, on average, a little better or has a higher average than uh, method one. Okay, 
Very good. So we now move on. So basically, we conclude. Sorry about that. So we're just concluding basically the the next step of sec chapter six. So it's basically uh, you take it here, here. So basically, this was the confidence interval. This was a confidence interval for um, variances. So we remember the result that this thing is chi square and then minus one. This is. I hope the result that we're going to use here. So basically we're going to look at the case where you have you have one variance. So we have x1 up to xn, uh, iid, sample size n from a Gaussian normal mu sigma squared, and uh, sigma squared is not known. Okay, we want to test the null hypothesis that sigma squared is a pre-specified value uh, versus some alternative depending on what we want. So remember that just as I said a moment ago, I hope I was making sense, that um, this is chi square n minus 1. We saw that repeatedly because basically these are chi, essentially there's a chi square in uh, square normals here. Okay, so we know that. So we have this distributional result. Okay, this is the distribution, this result holds, uh, uh, assuming the null hypothesis is true. Okay. So basically, if we want to tell the, t test this null hypothesis, this is giving our potential test statistics. So just exactly as I said, we have this result for our confidence intervals. We invert for the parameter there. Here, uh, we're going to use this uh, distributional result. So now what we want to do, so if we want to make this null hypothesis tested, uh, we basically have to consider the alternatives. So we have three alternatives. The first one is, the, the alternative hypothesis that we exceed this pre-specified value sigma squared. And then basically the critical region is whether our test statistic exceeds this quantile, the chi-square on n minus one alpha. And now if we want less than, so then we're, instead of having the right tail, we go to the left tail. So this value of chi, the chi-square statistic has to be strictly less than uh, the quantile chi-square n minus one, one minus alpha, okay? So you have to be very careful. Remember that this is alpha here, one minus alpha here. And then of course, in the two-sided case, we have to be bigger than this one except alpha over two and less than this one except alpha over two, okay? It's pretty much the same thing, okay? So remember that these are the quantiles. You get these uh, points from the uh, chi-square table. Okay, very good. So we can now basically exercise using this procedure. So the question is this, or the example is this. You have a manufacturer of car batteries claiming that the life of the batteries is approximately normally distributed with a standard deviation equal to 0.9 a year. So now we take 10 samples and we basically see 1.2, okay? The question is, do we think that basically sigma is bigger than 0.9 at the level of 0.05 significance or the probability of type 1 errors? So basically we are straightforward, this is straightforward. So we're testing the variance of the battery life. Uh, of course we want to reject the case that sigma squared is equal to 0.9, right? 0.9, sorry. So the 0.9 is our null that we're equal and that we exceed it, so it's sigma squared. Okay, you could do sigma, I suppose. It doesn't really make much difference. But then you have to square root of chi-square, which is less uh, pleasant. Okay, so we now set the null hypothesis. That, so the significance level was given to us at 0.05. Um, and um, we now set, we know that we have 10 data points, and we compute, uh, first of all, now, the uh, quantile the chi-square, so the chi-square are nine degrees of freedom with significance level 0.05, apparently. That's 16.919 for the table. I've gone through reading tables. I think that's pretty straightforward. Okay, now what we want to do is we want to compute now our test statistics. So our critical region is basically if we exceed this 16.919, we reject and otherwise we accept. Okay, this is our test statistic. This is a number of data points. This is our null hypothesized value of sigma squared. Okay, so 11.44, that apparently is, um, you're gonna get this. So standard deviation is 1.2, so if you square apparently it should be 1.44. Okay, uh, number of the data points is 10. So this chi-square statistic is basically, uh, no, a 1.44, yeah, that makes more sense. This is not 11.44, it's 1.44. Okay, so again, this is a typo. 
Okay, so the statistic is n minus 1, which is 9 times s squared over 0 0.81, okay, which is 16, okay? And you can also look at the um, p-value, which is the probability that uh, your statistic exceeds uh, the value 16, okay, which is uh, from the tables is roughly 0 0.07. Okay, so there are now some more interesting things happening here. Now, in this situation, the observed chi-square value is 16, and it lies outside the critical value, so we don't reject the null hypothesis, okay? And basically, we not, it's not really obvious. Uh, we have no reason to doubt that, that basically the standard deviation is 0 0.9 seems reasonable based upon this experimental data, and the p-value, in this sense, confirms it because Ren in this situation, our p-value is around 0 0.07, and our level of significance is 0 0.05. So now we really reject, I uh, don't reject. Okay, so for a, no a novel spin on uh, uh, this, uh, this set. So now we we're going to do, so our last hypothesis test is based upon, you might be happy to hear about that, our last hypothesis test is based upon this part of the lecture notes in chapter chapter um, six. So this is the confidence interval. Remember that back last week we were looking at the confidence interval for the ratio of two variances of normal populations with unknown means. So the setup was that you have x1 up to xn1, random sample size n1 from a normal mu1 sigma square 1, y1 up to yn2, independently as, as this distribution, iid. We don't know these two things, okay? And what we derived was that this ratio was F distributed on N1 minus 1, N2 minus 1 degrees of freedom, okay? In fact, we almost saw that this week. We did see it this week, as well, yesterday. Okay, so based on this fact, we're going to derive, I hope, I hope I pull this test. Yes, exactly. So basically, the underlying assumption, so this is the same situation I've just described to you. The underlying distributions are normal, independently. You don't know the means, and you're interested and concern, concerned with constructing a hypothesis test with respect to the ratio of the variances. Okay, so why would you want to do that? Well, when we're comparing the precision of one measuring device to that another, um, so an example, uh, the variability in grading practices of one teacher with that of another, the consistency of one production process with the other, and, we're, and basically, in these situations, you would be interested in the ratio of the variances. I mean, basically, whenever you're interested in the underlying process or a par underlying pair of processes, there could be the case you're interested in the associated ratio of precision or slash variances. So basically, then, if we quote basically the setup that we had yesterday even, the F statistic is that this ratio of variances, um, ratio of sample variance to true variance uh, uh, population variance is F on N1 minus 1, N2 minus 1 degrees of freedom. So if we basically make the null hypothesis that these two variances are equal, then, then basically the statistic that one would use is the ratio of these two sample variances. And so under the null, this is our sampling distribution. Okay? And now we can set up our hypothesis test um, as such. So that we'd make the null hypothesis that the variances are equal and our test statistic is just the ratio of the sample variances. It's very simple. Okay, and so now basically we want to think about the rejection region in our three scenarios for which the, uh, we have three, um, three alternative hypotheses which we're allowed to consider. The first one, remember, is that basically you could have sigma square one is bigger than sigma square two, and in this case you use a critical region where basically you're using N1 minus 1, N2 minus 1 alpha, okay, this is the level of significance. If we do sigma square 1, yeah, there's a typo here, this would be less than, I think. So this is less than, otherwise uh, this is, because otherwise this is exactly the same thing, I think. Then this should be that F is, our realized value is less than F, N1 minus 1, N2 minus 1, 1 minus alpha. I don't think those values are equal. And then basically, when they're not equal, F has to be less than this one or bigger than this one, one of the two, and then we reject. Okay? So alpha over two is a two-sided test. 
Very good. Okay, so let's have a look. So this is the final example of these lecture notes. Uh, hopefully by now we understand how to do the, uh, the tests. So we have an experiment. We're performed to compare the abrasive wear of two different laminated materials. So basically you get a sample size of 11 for material 1 and uh, 9 for material 2. Okay, so these are both tested in some ways. And in each case, the depth of the wear was observed. Okay, so basically, the samples of material one gave an average of 85 units with standard deviation four, and the other one was uh, 81 with standard deviation five. Okay, so we need these to compute our... Um, so basically, we're assuming we, we need these values apparently to compute our test statistic. So we know that the two sample populations, we don't know, but we're going to assume that they're basically of our case where they're independent uh, of each other and basically IID Gaussians with um, unknown population variances. And we're going to test the null that the variances are equal at a level of 10% significance. I mean, basically, this is an example which is just a restatement of having to use this statistic here, capital F. Okay. So step one, so we're going to basically test the case where we're equal, the null hypothesis. So this test, so again, this is a slight typo here. This should be H1, really. Uh, H0, sorry. And the alternatives are that they're not equal. And uh, of course, we know our level significance is 0 0.1. OK, so our sample size is 11 and 9, respectively. So we can compute our, t our test statistic. Uh, sorry, our rejection region. So we have can compute five, sorry, five F of uh, ten, eight, and uh, this is 0 0.05. Okay, that's 3.35. Um, now, what we want to do for the other part of the rejection region? So remember, the other part of the rejection region, oops, sorry, it's, it's this one. So that's um, whatever that was, 11 minus nine or whatever it was, 11. Yes, 11 and nine. So this is this is this value, this is F108, 0.95. So remember, we have a relationship between these F quantiles. That's exactly 1 over F. But now we've flipped these, these around, 8 and 10, and then we have 0 0.05. Okay. And this one you get from the table is apparently 3.07. So the other part is 0 0.326. So basically, we're rejecting if we are less than 3.326 or bigger than 3.35, where F is basically the ratio... Uh, this is a, is um, uh, capital S. Okay, so now the F statistic is straightforward to compute. We get 16 and 25. I mean, the only information that we had here that was relevant is this standard deviation here and this standard deviation here. Okay, so the, the, the test statistic is simply 16 over 25, uh, which is 0 0.64. Okay, so in this case, 0 0.64 is um, lies outside the critical region, so we don't reject. So in this case, by the way, the computing the, the uh, p-value is non-trivial because this F statistic is really hard to get at the p-values here normally. I mean, it's not hard. I mean, you can do it numerically, but um, since you haven't got a computer in the exam, I guess we don't teach you how to do that. Okay, so that's that's it. That's chapters uh, one to seven. Those were the lecture notes that uh, we were assigned to do. Um, today, I don't have any more material for you, but I do have mater more material to look at. So let me just tell you what we're going to do next week. You can decide whether or not you want to come or not. Um, the material that we're doing next week, only next week, is non-examinable. So don't you don't please don't re if you're taking the exam, please don't revise it. Um, just to show you what it is, uh, because we have the time. Let's have a look. Sorry, I'm going to have to log in. So I should have done this beforehand. Sorry, hold on a minute. Okay, so hopefully we'll log on and uh, I can show you what we have. <sighs> Here we are. So. Um, So, so this is called additional PDF. So this is some things that we'll look at next week. 
So the key point, as you say, as I said, now, these are not exam and also don't practice it. Don't if you don't go through, you don't need to go through these notes. What's the point of these notes? Well, they basically give you some more detail. This is basically what I used to teach when I taught ST2334. And I stopped doing it because people find it too difficult. But anyway, this is just some notes on conditional expectations. So we had done that a little bit. So I'm just going to go through these conditional expectations computation in the case we have discrete random variables, um, continuous random variables. And then basically an application of this stuff is in a type of inferential procedure called Bayesian statistics. So this is really, so if you're really interested in probability and statistics, you're going to get something which is a new statistical paradigm perhaps to you. Actually, this, this type of inference is used routinely in machine learning and uh, all this AI and all these things. This is very important there. So you will learn something of relevance, even if you're not examined on it. I will not examine you on that. And then there's some examples right at the end. I mean, there's a little bit of math there, but it's no need to be scared of it because you're not examined on it, okay? So that's what we're going to do next week. So you have two sessions, and uh, you know, hopefully we'll get through. We should be able to get through all of that. So that's what we're doing next week. The week after. So again, if you do, if you're interested in property statistics, please come by. And if not, then uh, maybe you'll just watch it on video. And then the week after, what we'll be doing is to go through last year's last semester's exam. So there was ST two three four last semester. The exam this semester will be at the level of last semester's exam, so it'd be good if you can understand how to do last semester's exam. So I'll go through that, plus some additional uh, questions which I'll invent for the basis of our discussion. Okay, so that's all I have for you this week. Uh, that's the end of the examinable material, so you don't have to come anymore if you don't want to. And there's only two weeks left of the course because uh, we're out of material. Thanks very much for your attention, and I'll see you on Thursday next week.